right, welcome everybody. I'm Lucian Fogoros. I'm the co-founder of IoT World, and I'm excited to welcome you today. Over 5,800 people decided to register for today's sessions. Uh, we have about 10 of them. And I'm excited to introduce the, the moderator of the first one, uh, Graham, Graham Immerman uh, from Machine Metrics. Welcome, the floor is yours. As I meet myself, of course. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our IIoT Day uh, World Panel. Uh, a brief preload, if you will. Um, for those of us in the manufacturing community, it's been quite a last couple of years. What we've seen is unpredictable supply chains, shifting consumer demands, turbulent global market dynamics are forcing manufacturers to pursue a new level of business agility. They never thought. Uh, would be possible just 10 years ago. The window of time to respond to change has shrunk significantly. In order to succeed in this heightened competitive environment, manufacturers must be prepared to ramp up production to meet this surging customer needs and maintain productivity amid workforce shortages. Agility, of course, must be accompanied by innovation. The ability to rapidly create new business processes and optimize existing ones are key to maintaining a competitive advantage, but manufacturers' ability to thrive uh, is only as good as the technologies that they rely on to manage their operations. And unfortunately, in today's, in today's manufacturing software ecosystem, most manufacturers hate their operations management systems like ERP and MES, and the reasons are numerous. Today's systems are too dependent on manual data input. This data entry uh, heavy approach has given these systems really bad names, many failed implementations. Um, these solutions try to do everything within one system, attempting to bundle all features required uh, to run a manufacturing operation within one system, whereas no one system can truly do everything well enough. And of course, the cost, the difficulty of deployment, the speed of scale stifles uh, value creation and innovation. Uh, creating an over-reliance on technology that was designed for, 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 for past times. We can't solve the problems of tomorrow with the tools of the past. The reality is that in today's ultra-competitive world, manufacturers must be empowered by their software and not held captive by it. So a new school of thought is emerging, led by visionary software companies, some of which you'll see here today within this panel, uh, working together with one shared goal to accelerate our industry's ability to connect optimize, adapt, and evolve no matter what the circumstances may be. Is this the death of MES as we know it? During this panel, we will discuss the problems of the standard approach to building these manufacturing operation systems and paint a vision for a solution landscape based on the following principles. People and systems should be driven by data, not the other way around. A world of choice where manufacturers are free to build a tech stack with the tools that they need, not just the ones that the suite uh, that they have previously used is chosen for them, a world of flexibility, a world of opportunity where every manufacturer can have the technology and ability to be uh, innovation first. So to get things started, uh, let's do a quick poll. Um, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the poll onto the screen, that would be great. So the first question I have for, for everybody who's here today uh, is, and hopefully the poll will come up momentarily for, for those of you, uh, who can see it, but how satisfied are you with your current ERP and MES implementation? While you guys are starting to fill out this poll, and I urge everybody who's here today to fill it out and give me your, give me your, uh, your two cents on it, from very dissatisfied, dissatisfied, neither dissatisfied nor dissatisfied, satisfied or very satisfied, I'd like to also introduce our panelists today. So uh, getting started, uh, our first panelist, uh, is Bill Beither, CEO, co-founder of Machine Metrics. Bill, Machine Metrics calls itself the machine data component of the digital factory. Why did you start Machine Metrics and what problem does your platform solve? Thanks, Graham. Uh, so yeah, the, the reason we started Machine Metrics is that um, you know, we've seen in the factory floor that there's just this uh, tremendous uh, lack of data that's used in, in decisions in particular from, um, from machines. And uh, like you mentioned, um, when you uh, your manufacturing operation systems really um, you know really require this data to uh, to make decisions uh, so your frontline workers um, you know have what they need to um, you know, to get their job done efficiently. 
So machine metrics really is an industrial data platform that makes it easy to capture data from this equipment and then generate actionable insights. And these insights are helping frontline workers to automate workflows around the machine and uh, also automate data flow into other factory systems. So you know, we now have hundreds of manufacturers globally that are using machine metrics really to increase their, their productivity with real-time visualizations from this, um, from this equipment, uh, factory process autom uh, optimizations, and also uh, predictive insights that, that really allow you to understand what, what will be happening with your equipment. And this, uh, this helps both those uh, frontline workers and, and other systems to, um, uh, to, to be more efficient. So uh, that's really why, why we created Machine Metrics. Thanks, Grant. Excellent. Excellent, Bill. We really appreciate it to have you here today. Uh, we also have Sunny Yu, who's a CEO and co-founder of, of Fulcrum ERP. Sunny, you're bravely sitting on a panel about the death of ERP and are an ERP provider. Uh, what makes Fulcrum's philosophy different than others? Yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, I think a lot of what you said in the intro really applies to our philosophy of how we see the world. Um, we went through a long period of time as an entire civilization trying to optimize the efficiency of really repeatable tasks. But over time with the internet, with the growth of how we do things in the world, um, that type of really large scale repeatable processes are becoming more and more fragile. And like you said, uh, so many of us have seen this in the past before the pandemic, but with the supply chain issues, the crunch, the bullwhip effects that are going on in the marketplace right now, a lot of these problems are becoming extremely visible to not just people who work in manufacturing. So for us, we see systems that are created and rooted in this old methodology of a very small amount of change, a very consistent and predictable processes. And we're entering a world where every company has to be more adaptable, less fragile, and just has to have an ecosystem of support that looks more like a reorganizable set of tools and a reorganizable set of value instead of something that's monolithic that never ever changes or is extremely expensive to change. So for us, we wanna make our product as close to dynamically changing and evolving as possible. And that just requires a completely different way of thinking and building the product. Excellent, Sonny. We, we are very excited to hear some of your uh, your feedback uh, on, on this topic specifically. And we also have Ryan Chan, who's the CEO and co-founder of Upkeep. Ryan, your approach has been very unique for the space. You really focused on the frontline worker and the user of the platform. Tell us a bit about Upkeep and why you started it. Sure. Thanks, Graham. And. For everyone that joined us today, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Again, as Graham mentioned, my name is Ryan, I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Um, we're based here in Los Angeles, California. It's currently 5.30 in the morning. Uh, my background for, for everyone, I went to Cal Berkeley as a chemical engineer. My first job was actually working in a manufacturing plant, spun out of DuPont Chemicals. We manufactured reverse osmosis membranes for fractious water desalination. A little bit of wastewater. So my job there, my role there was, was actually as a process engineer. I spent every single day thinking about how do we improve our manufacturing line process? How do we make it more efficient, more productive, more reliable? Saw technology, I was actually responsible for implementing some technology and more specifically enterprise asset management software and realized that there had to be a better way that was geared towards the field technicians, the field workers, the shop floor workers. Because what I saw was they were tasked with a ton of double and triple entry work that wasn't productive to the business. So I wound up teaching myself how to code, build, uh, all to build better technology for the shop floor worker. Um, over the last couple of years, five years, six years, we've raised about $50 million in venture, we're 170 people, and we've got one mission. It's dedicated towards building better technology for the frontline worker, as you had mentioned, Graham. Excellent. Well, Ryan, we're super glad to have you here and also working together again on the panel. Uh, so we're here, we're at the main event. We're talking about a new vision for the factory software stack. But before we can really do that, let's set the stage a little bit. Bill, manufacturers' dissatisfaction with MES or ERP is so prevalent that it has become somewhat of a running joke in the industry. I, I sat in a room of manufacturers in Utah last month and asked them to raise their hand if anybody uh, in the room was happy with their current ERP MES system. Not a single hand was raised. Uh, why do manufacturers hate these systems so much and why is it coming to a head today? 
Well, that's <clears throat> that's why we're here, right? So like you previously said, Graham, I mean, ERP systems are generally monolithic. Um, they, um, they're they pretty difficult to implement, to customize. Um, they don't always fit your, your exact business. You know, every manufacturer has differences and uh, these ERP systems you know, do their, their best to try to fit your business, but they really are a jack of all trades, master of none. You do have these uh, more niche ERP systems. Um, this is why you see so much fragmentation in manufacturing. And um, you know, the problem with them is that they attempt to really fit your business um, for, like a, for a niche manufacturer, but the, their, their um, addressable market is so small, they're unable to put the resources into building really good software. So you end up with either you know, massive ERP systems that require you know, sometimes years to implement and, um, and eventually you know, some of these companies will get it right. Um, or you have these really niche ERP providers that also try to basically do everything for, for your company, but um, you know, the software really isn't that good. So, um, so that's really one of the you know, sort of the, the main issues um, with that. And, and um, you know, it's also hard because when, you're, when your business changes, these systems, you know, really aren't designed to be very flexible. I mean, they have, um, you're going to have to call your system integrator, you're going to have to, um, you know, customize, and, and it's generally really hard to do. And um, that's, that's really the, you know, what we see, we, you know, like you, Graham, I mean, I mean, I, I talked to a lot of our customers and very few are, are happy with their systems. And, and uh, we're starting to see that there's a, a better way that I'm excited to talk about today. Awesome, Bill. Thank you for the context around that. And Sonny, I'm sure many of our attendees have blocked out painful memories for various MES or ERP implementations. I call it a bit of a trauma uh, that's almost like affected many manufacturers when um, they come to, um, you know, actually implementing new types of software. Um, can you describe some of the most common challenges manufacturers tend to experience implementing these systems? And uh, while you start doing that, we're also going to share the results of our poll. Uh, but what are some of the challenges that they tend to experience? Yeah, I think there's this concept from a long time ago. It's called Conway's Law. We use it when we talk about software development. And underlying the, the notion that, that this, this law states is that the architecture, the communication architecture of your company affects the communication architecture of the product that you build in software. And I think this principle applies to ERP implementations as well. When you're implementing an ERP, a static monolithic one, you're inheriting the business processes, the communication architecture that that piece of software dictates. And the probability that your business just fits that architecture is extremely low. And what that means is that people are gonna have to shift around. They're gonna have to shift what they do. They're gonna have to shift how they see things. They're gonna have to you know, centralize the data collection in a certain way. And that is gonna cause a significant amount of pain. It's gonna cause people raising questions about whether this is a problem or not, or whether we're going to miss a, a, a piece of information or a piece of insight. So I think that what the, the current market of ERP has evolved into is this kind of weird dance between how can I customize and adapt the ERP and how can I customize and adapt my business? And I think that the, the, the thing that I said earlier, the thing that's really troubling is that both your business and the software should both be adaptable and changeable at the same time. And that's just not the case. And that pain that most people feel comes from that, comes from this tension of who is right. This company that doesn't know me, that provides software that's supposed to be the bedrock foundational software system that we use, or us who are on the shop floor doing the work, um, you know, talking to customers, designing and engineering the way that we build things. And, and I, I think that that tension is, is fundamental to any system that's monolithic. Mm. It makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, Sonny, you, you also uh, insinuated, you know, uh, with a little bit of the fact that with these monolithic systems, uh, you know, they require a lot of, you know, handholding and people to manage. And Ryan, uh, um, unfortunately, as many of us know firsthand, uh, manufacturing is suffering from this ever-growing skills gap. Um, there are just simply not enough skilled uh, workers to support the demand for product, let alone uh, monolithic systems, right? And a recent uh, report from Deloitte showed that an estimated 2.1 million open manufacturing positions may prove quite difficult to fill by 2030. So how does this critical issue affect, if at all, 
the requirements for a modern day manufacturing software solution? Well, you know, it's a really good point to bring up, Graham. Um, and I want to like let that sink in for a little bit here again. There are 2.1 million open manufacturing positions. And we've talked a ton about this skills gap. And I think what we can all agree on in 2021, going into 2022, is that the time and need and drive for better technology is right now. I think historically, manufacturing has been a laggard in adopting new technology. Adopting new technology. Oops, I hear an echo of myself. <laughs> Oops. Um, and so manufacturing, there's been a, has been a laggard in, in adopting new technology and digital transformation. We've been talking about it for ages. There's this skills gap going on right now. And regardless of whether or not you're happy or not with your MES, I think the one thing that we can all align on is that we're here in 2021, there's an opportunity to build, implement, and use better systems, better tools, better technology, and put like you know, this digital transformation into the right now. In terms of how it's really affecting, you know, the push and drive towards technology, I think you've seen two things. One, you've seen uh, obviously the skills gap, but then the second thing that's been a big driver for digital transformation and change has actually been COVID. Not only are we seeing a skills gap, we're also seeing a shortage in the existing labor force. Um, Right now, we believe that the shop floor workers are being undervalued and you know, not really uh, valued for the work that they do. And in terms of how it's really affecting the day-to-day, -day, I think you're just seeing a greater, greater need for this push towards digital transformation, the need for better tools, technology, and software. Um, you know, the one thing that, that I want to say is like, the time is right now. The time is right now to you know, use better tools, technology, software. I mean, it exists today, and ultimately, that's why we're here on this panel, Graham. I appreciate it, Brian. And you know, in, in the previous generation, right, of these manufacturing software, it almost seemed like uh, the logical solution, right, to tackle all this functionality within one platform, right? But you know, look, we're living in the age of SaaS, right? Uh, products are more specialized, often vertically integrated. They leverage AI, have richer APIs. Uh, I was followed around the internet by a retargeting ad from an ERP uh, vendor uh, linked to a piece that uh, discussed how manufacturers like to buy one system that does everything. Uh, Bill, is it still the case? Or do you feel that manufacturers are more receptive to an alternate approach? You're, and you're muted. That's your one for today. <laughs> yeah, that's my uh, my lesson today, number two. Um, so if you if you look at the um, the poll, you'll see that only two percent are uh, of the attendees are satisfied with their ERP. So I think um, there's definitely a um, you know this uh, you know now is the time you know to to change. And there um, up until recently, really the the monolithic ERP was kind of the only option, right? You didn't have these. Um, these vertically integrated uh, SaaS tools that could easily connect. We're still in the infancy, though. I mean, it's um, it's not the holy grail yet, right? There are still gaps. But um, what's great about you know taking the approach of having more of a decentralized approach to your MES is that um, you don't have to boil the ocean. You know, for example, if you already have an ERP implementation. Yet you're having to spend you know, so much time manually entering in data at the end of every shift, at the end of every job, and you're having inaccuracies. Um, you can start with a machine monitoring solution to automate that data flow into your ERP. Uh, and then you know, if you're, you're lacking the, uh, the ability to, um, to really manage your maintenance of your equipment, you know, pull in a CMMS solution. Uh, so if you have a, an issue with uh, quality, you know, find a, a really great uh, quality management system, you know, integrate with that. And what you can do is you don't have to, um, you don't have to start basically ripping out your entire system and then bring in something new. You can, you can, you, you basically just take it, you know, piece at a time. And that's, that's really one of the great benefits of having this decentralized approach. Um, there's challenges with that and we'll get to that in a bit, but, um, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's really, a, a, I, I'd say the, you know, where, where you would start and, um, 
you know, and I would even I would even say that if you don't have an ERP system, like some of our smaller customers, they might um, be starting with spreadsheets. You know, you could just start with updating those spreadsheets, automating the data flow, and then and then building it from there. And uh, yeah, and uh, and I think that's really what we have in front of us, and and I I believe that's that's why we're starting to see this move into the decentralized um, approach. Thanks, Bill. And uh, for those of you who are, uh, are asking questions, boy, are they kind of flowing in. We've got about 50 or so questions so far. Um, I know that people are dropping them into the chat too uh, for the sake of organization. And so we can get to as many of them as you can. Uh, feel free to drop those into the Q&A as well. Um, it's pretty interesting to note again that only 2% were, were very satisfied with their ERP systems. Um, but the far majority either didn't seem uh, particularly satisfied nor dissatisfied and you know well over a third were unhappy with their system so that leaves uh, a lot of room for for improvement here um, and we can uh, close the poll so it doesn't have to be on the screen for the rest of the time thank you for the, the technical guys at iot world okay uh sunny question for you um in the late 1980s essentially mes was born out of this necessity uh, due to ERP's inability to capture shop floor transactions in real time. While MES was a significant step forward for manufacturers at this time, the capabilities were essentially uh, built for the technology available in the 1980s. How have advancements in modern technology changed what's possible for these systems? Advancements in modern technology changed possible for these I think, um, you know, I, I grew up in an age where the internet didn't exist for a while, and at that certain point in time in my childhood, it, it exists. Um, there was a period of time in, in you know, a change in the 80s and 90s where most people didn't have devices and have computers. And I think that the, the primary way to think about it is that this, this acronym of enterprise resource planning, this was made up from a marketing person like yourself to try to explain what these systems were. It was based on the Star Trek enterprise, right? It was a way to explain a computer system that could aggregate all this information and hold it. Well, it's funny, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but your audio and the technology is shopping, real time bro. are just very much- It's funny, I don't want to interrupt you, but your audio is shopping, bro. Okay, uh, one second. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I think there's, there might actually be some uh, technical glitch right now. So maybe we can come back to this question and you can move on to another question. Yeah, no problem, Sonny. We'll get back to this question. Maybe you could reset your uh, connectivity. Uh, love the age of the internet, everybody. Uh, Bill, uh, you know, moving on to the question for you. Uh, you know, one of the top knocks on MES systems today is that they just aren't scalable. Uh, of course, scalability is at the heart of the Industry 4.0 paradigm. Building scalability backwards takes time and adds additional cost. Uh, whether you're standing up a new facility, part of M&A market, or trying to standardize processes across locations, um, how, what is it about an ecosystem approach that provides more scalability versus, say, like an all-in-one system? Yeah, I mean, the, we touched on it earlier, but I think the um, an all-in-one system is um, really doesn't change to your changing business needs very easily. So as your business grows, um, you're going to have like new requirements, new you know new processes, and um, it's really difficult when you um, when you have that that one system. If you have um, a series of vertically integrated faster breed SaaS or you know, App applications, you can pull one out and bring a new one in um, as, as needed. Um, the, um, so that really is um, you know, one, one of the reasons that there were some questions around um, ISA 95. And uh, ISA 95 is a, is, a, is a good model, but what we're seeing is like most MES companies, you know, it's really difficult to adopt. It's a very structured, uh, system that um, that is uh, doesn't necessarily consider the implementation of you know every single piece. Very few, even the largest uh, uh, MES systems, don't uh, apply it strictly. And um, what you're what you're able to do with a with a decentralized system is really focus on 
the you know the area that that you do best. I mean, what we you know, obviously machine metrics. We're really focused on capturing data for machines, making that accessible, uh, transforming that into a common structure, so that you can you know you can basically kick off activities and other systems. And that that is um, you know we apply some of the uh, ISA ninety five elements to that, but we don't have to take the entire standard. We'll leave that to um, you know to the uh, production management system, the inventory um, operation system. Uh, so um, rambling a little bit, but I think that you know the point is that um, it is difficult to scale um, without spending a ton of money to continue to customize at the same pace as, as your business with a monolithic ERP. Yeah, it, you know it, it makes a lot of sense. And Bill, you made a lot of great points about kind of like the standards of the past and you know what what are the new standards for today. Um, you know, Ryan, a question for you. You know, manufacturers are you know showing significant interest in these industry 4.0 initiatives. However, many of these projects fail to move beyond that pilot stage. And you know, what we're seeing is to move on you know, beyond pilot purgatory and enable these rapid adoptions of the right use cases. Companies need to first build the capabilities to support these use cases. Uh, what advice would you give to manufacturers who keep finding themselves you know, in that pilot purgatory phase of implementation? Sure. So. Advice for getting out of pilot purgatory. I think this all comes from what indecision and unsure of commitment, right? Um, at least for us, what we always tell all of our customers, prospects, people in the industry is get to time, get to value ASAP. Um, pilots don't add value, and so when we when we think about deploying systems, implementing systems, Tim actually brought up a really good point. Here in the chat, Tim Smith, um, the, real the real issue is adoption. Um, the real issue is getting people to adopt to technology and get to value. And again, as I mentioned, pilots don't add value. You're stuck in pilot purgatory. And, you know, we kind of talk about like, you know, do you like your MES? Do you dislike your MES? Um, you know, ultimately, the big question there is, is not so much do you like it or do you love it or do you hate it? The big question should really be, are you getting value out of it? It's, it's kind great. of like asking, yeah, I mean, it's, it's literally like asking the question, do you like cleaning a toilet? Do you like doing laundry? The better question is really like, is it driving better positive ROI? And I hope that people are answering that question, not because you know it's not fun to use because they don't like it, but really answering the question around, are you getting value from it? What we always tell, you know, everyone in our space, in our space, enterprise asset management, is that 70% of enterprise asset management deployments, you know, yes, they can be deployed. You get out of this pilot, pilot phase, but 70% of enterprise asset management deployments are failing to deliver positive ROI for a business. There's three reasons why. People, process, and ultimately technology. So ultimately, when we talk about like getting out of pilot pur purgatory, the biggest advice here is this shit takes time, but get to value as soon as possible. Get out of the pilot phase as soon as possible. Start getting to you know, some sort of value. Uh, don't do big bangs, do slow releases and get value along the way. Yeah, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, if you minimize the pilot, right, without having some sort of a value proposition or realization formula, it's like, why are we doing this in the first place? Like your strategy should be, you know, uh, demonstrate value, but then have an instant scale plan for that value, right? If you don't have those two things together, you know, it's like, why are we doing the pilot in the first place, right? It's not just to try out cool new things. It's because we're proving out a value proposition so it can be scaled out. Right. Um, so great point, Ryan. Um, so Sonny, you're back. You're connected. Internet's being more friendly again. Um, many enterprises have already made these significant investments in, you know, ERP or MES or other manufacturing operation systems. What considerations should manufacturers take to leverage and even enhance their current software rather than maybe the costly like rip and replace strategy? And then what roles do these play within the modern digital factory software ecosystem now that maybe they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, their, their necessity or their characteristics have changed somewhat. 
Yeah, I think more and more there are companies like Upkeep and Machine Metrics and, and a, a litany of other companies out there that are delivering value to solve some of these very specific problems that exist out there that are gaps in the ERP space. So um, even though there is going to be some double entry if these systems aren't integratable, I think what all of our customers have seen is that in lieu of a rip and replace, even implementing a few systems to cover those gaps, as long as those systems are engineered and built in a way that are future facing, they will connect with other systems in the future. So don't be afraid of adopting those technologies and using them if it's going to help your business now. I think there's this big fear of not making a choice now because I, I'm, I'm still thinking in this mode of doing buying a, a one solution solves everything. And I think being really courageous and, and able and willing to adopt those you know, point solutions, assuming they'll integrate, is a good way to go. Yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, uh, you know, back to Ryan here, uh, you know, these legacy system providers have been, you know, kind of selling manufacturers for years on the premise of the single vendor like approach, like Sonny was saying. And now we're starting to see these, these same vendors kind of scramble to almost like bolt on these solutions, right, to meet their own capabilities. We've definitely seen like, um, you know, it's almost like it becomes like a Frankenstein, right? You're just starting to bolt on IoT and AI and ML onto these monoliths. Like, is a single uh, vendor meets all vision even achievable? And like, if so, like, you know, or like, is, is it more that like, it's a, you know, many, many systems kind of like create one system? Like, what, what is the solution here? What's the solution and is it achievable? I think everyone wants to believe that it is achievable because that's a holy grail of, you know, 10 years, 10 year contracts, zero churn and, you know, increasing share of wallet for everyone. Um, but, but maybe the better question is like, where is this coming from? I, I think where, where, where this all stems from is having a single system of record for all of your data. SAP is a system of record, Oracle is, an ERP and MES system is generally the system of record. And oftentimes that having that system of record is super important. Why? Because I, I, I personally believe it. I think everyone here on this entire panel believes this too, that cross-functional teams and having data from cross-functional teams is actually extremely helpful in driving the best decisions across the entire, you know, across the entire business. And so when we look at it from that perspective, it actually is important to have this, you know, one solution that actually contains all of this data. I think that one thing that has changed in the more recent era is the birth of new technologies that actually help bring together, you know, all of this data across different teams like Power BI, um, whether that's Tableau, whether that's, you know, Looker. These are actually things that have changed in the last, you know, couple of years that we didn't really have access to 10 years ago. So the, the question around like, is it possible? I think it is possible, but it's very difficult. Oftentimes what we're gonna find, what I believe we're gonna find is best in breed vertical solutions with open platforms coupled with BI solutions that will enable us to have these like cross-functional um, you know, data, data reports that enable us to drive the best decision. Um, I, I think that's what's going to drive the best innovation in our space that will drive the best decisions for a company. I think we live in this capitalistic society. It's kind of asking the question, you know, is this a monopoly or is this, you know, a, a free market society? I, uh, that's kind of my prediction, Graham. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah. Let's get the uh, right. I mean, I think, you know, I think at least for all the, you know, the, you know, vertical software providers here, I think we all, yeah, we all share that vision. And, you know, the reality is I think we all believe that that's, you know, the fastest way to create more value for the manufacturers, the more agility, more flexibility, you know, Bill, like the, the, the vision of this best of breed ecosystem is obviously appealing, not just for the vendors, but for the manufacturers, given this potential for flexibility and, acceleration of time to value, but there's undeniable challenges to achieving this vision. You know, what would you say are the greatest challenges that must be overcome? And what advice do you have for manufacturers to maybe 
you know, unstick some of those challenges and get started creating value today? Yeah, I mean, there's a yeah, there's still a few challenges here. Um, the space is not yet mature. Um, you know, companies like Machine Metrics, Fulcrum, up, Upkeep. I mean, we're, I mean, we're pretty new, right? So the um, where we're where we're driving towards is having out of the box integrations with you know with each of these best of breed factory systems, but we're not there yet, right? So you know, we have some, but we don't have all of them. And it's unlikely that when you pick all of your systems that they're just going to integrate with a click of a button. So the, um, so you will have to build some of these integrations. And uh, fortunately we have um, some of these um, uh, low code tools that can help us. Uh, tools like uh, uh, Zapier, Integromat, Trade.io um, that, that'll help connect these APIs so that your data can flow from one system to, to another. Um, there's, um, but you'll need, you'll need somebody to do that and to maintain it, right? So it's, you're going to, you're basically taking a, um, you know, an outside system integrator that would have to build custom code. Uh, and, um, and you, you take that and I think you minimize the amount of effort that's required to integrate these systems, but there's still work, right? Until there's these out-of-the-box integrations. So there's, there's definitely a challenge there. And it, it might be a resource that you don't have. Uh, available to you right away. I mean, somebody that um, that can you know think about systems and data and and connect them. Um, that that really is. I recommend that you have somebody available to you that uh, that can help you with that. Um, you know, the um, the other is um, there's a, there's a concept like if you the, the other approach is having a data warehouse. Okay, a data warehouse is um, generally for the um, you know mid to like larger manufacturers. That's something you might want to consider. Where you're pulling data in from multiple systems into one data warehouse, one one system that you can then sit uh, put BI on top of that. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned you know the you know, sort of innovations on like Tableau, Looker, or Power BI. Um, this allows you to really build your own visualizations from multiple systems, and having that data warehouse can really help you. Um, there's a there's another concept called the unified namespace. Okay, that that's something that's um, you know, we're, we're starting to hear about that more. Uh, which is, you know, I look at it as similar to data warehouse, but it's not, it doesn't really define the storage. Really, it's one place to go to, to pull, pull your data. And again, that can help you um, with, uh, with all these disparate systems communicating in, in one essential uh, language. So these are all um, you know, pretty new developments, uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the path, I, I would really strongly, strongly suggest that that path is going to lead to more value Faster, you know, faster time to value and, uh, and a better overall system, and that's really where manufacturing operations is headed. And you know, Bill, it's funny. Like you, you touched on a number of, of of great topics there that you know we're also getting tons of questions about. So, yeah, you know, I'll do my best to like get to as many of these as possible. Literally hundreds of questions coming in. Uh, you know, but you know, what are like you know? So you know, obviously, like you know, one of the biggest problems in manufacturing is people, right? And you know, we're saying, hey, we want to have you know, people help solve this problem. But what are vendors like Upkeep, Fulcrum, Machine Metrics doing, right? Uh, working together to make this easier for manufacturers today, right? Does, do all these integrations require a system integrator? Uh, what is, what, what do you want to look for in a vendor, for example, and say, hey, like, you know, well, this vendor has X, Y, or Z, so we know that it can maybe play nicely with another one. What, what does that look like, Bill? Uh, really strong APIs, open architecture. Um, that's uh, I think that is really the the um, the most important aspect of being able to connect to other systems is having that uh, that data accessible. Um, you know we've seen because you know we're integrating with um, some of these uh, more legacy ERPs and it's really difficult, right? It's hard to get access to that data to. You know to I mean just that the simple use case for us, right, is you know taking that production data and sending it to your ERP or MES system to cut out that data entry. That can be really difficult if you don't have open APIs. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be, if there's one thing, that, that, would, be, that would be it. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, like, so that, like now we're getting so many questions coming in. I'm going to do my best to use the last 15 minutes to get to some of these and maybe even open up the conversation a bit to the audience. Um, you know, question, you know, for you, Sonny, you know, how are you going about kind of, you know, you're a more vertically focused ERP. 
right? Um, clearly like bought into the notion that, you know, it's not all about just, you know, you, you're gonna have to play nicely with other vendors. How are you convincing end users who are kind of being promised, you know, um, this, you know, all in one uh, silver bullet um, to, and are, you know, almost feeling locked in to what they were doing today to consider other approaches to working with, you know, a vendor like Fulcrum, for example. Yeah, I think that there is a growing understanding that complexity is not the same thing as something that's complicated. It might seem really simple to have everything in one box, but those solutions are oftentimes burying a significant amount of complexity that comes out during that implementation, that pain that you talked about earlier. It might seem complicated to have an upkeep of machine metrics, a fulcrum, and all these different players playing together, but that's something that we can solve for, automate, and, and make really, really um, great. And I think most manufacturers understand this, right? They understand that the manufacturing industry isn't one hugely vertically integrated manufacturer that does, you know, bending and, and CNC machining and powder coating and every operation that possibly could exist. Because you know intuitively just how much complexity would happen if you had all those things all under one roof. And the market has proved that. Very similarly, the market is going to continue to prove that minimizing complexity, even if it becomes a little bit more complicated, is going to be the right approach. And, and for us, most of our customers, we don't have to convince them of that. They already intuitively understand it. They just haven't had an opportunity to work with folks like us who, um, to call back to Bill's earlier question, I think also one of the, um, the, the biggest differences about us, about this group here, is that we believe that this software ecosystem is a non-zero sum system. We believe that working together isn't going to hurt any one of us. It's not going to steal market share from each other. We're not looking at each other as potential competitors. We're just trying to make all this software work together as best as possible. And we have a deep commitment and belief that doing that will make everything better. So I think it's it's a, a bit of a, a, a just a, um, a paradigm shift in the way that people are looking at software, driven largely by consumer software and, and people seeing this happen in, in all sorts of different iterations. I think there's an assumption now that this is the way that it should work instead of fighting against that current. We don't really meet that much resistance in the marketplace to that concept. Yeah, you know, it's interesting as a marketer, you know, I use, you know, I don't, our, my, my department uses what, 13, 15 different software pieces right, that, you know, we, we connect, we integrate, right, we have maybe even a centralized CRM where all that, you know, works within, but it's, it's almost the, the standard, um, you know, in almost every other vertical that you're, you know, working with all these different systems, right, but, you know, uh, you know to, the, to the other side of that point, you know, marketers are highly, you know, technical, right, uh, you know, we, we were born on the internet, right, that's like where our entire, uh, you know, our entire um, experience is, right, it's, you know, using digital tools and technology, right, you know, now manufacturers, while highly technical in different ways, right, it's, uh, you know, it's still in some ways, you know, logging into AOL times for manufacturing, right, I mean, you know, um, you know, so like, I guess, uh, you know, question, Ryan, and then, you know, I can even open up for the rest of the group, you know, we, we're hearing this concept of like, you know, IT, OT convergence, is it, is, it, is it really convergence or are we just starting to see like the takeover of IT, you know, really in manufacturing? Like, is, that, is that where, you know, we're seeing more of this, this technology um, start being driven or does OT need to almost, you know, uh, you know, uh, get, you know, get their, uh, you know, get their learning on? Like, what does that look like? Um, it's a good question. Is it converging? I think what we're starting to see in the IT world is the pace of innovation to speed up. I think what people have realized is that software has a massive potential for innovation in the space. And on the hardware side, you know, it kind of has and serves its own function. But we're so behind in what software and, I, and the IT side can actually do that over the last couple of years, we've just seen this, you know, to your point, proliferation of new vendors, new companies, new products really spin up. The, the potential is there. So like, is it converging or is it just um, the IT side of the world um, accelerating? Maybe it's kind of like the same thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe, <laughs> you know, it, you know, it's true. I mean, look like, uh, and, and this kind of like, you were getting a lot of questions around this. So kind of like follow up on that and maybe, you know, even have like, um, you know, Bill uh, jump in a bit on this too, right? You got, you know, while you're decentralizing this architecture, right? And, you know, you're hearing this as like an emerging theme. And this is a great question that came in from Sarah. Uh, you know, another theme uh, has been uh, the integration of these traditional siloed areas like operations and quality and, and maintenance through these integrations of disparate data sources into a common platform. I guess the question is, how are challenges around data collection and storage different in a more decentralized approach to software over maybe even a traditional large monolithic solution? And how are you uh, and companies like, you know, the people here today approaching solving this problem? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so I think that if you have a decentralized um, systems, you know, each, you know, each area of the stack is going to have their own sort of um, you know, way that they store data, they describe data. Um, it, you do need to have a way for that to communicate. So like, yeah, machine monitoring, we're dealing with you know, all this time series data around, um, around sort of machine conditions, uh, alarms, also, you know, understanding what, um, what jobs are running, right? And then the production system understands the job that's running, but not necessarily the machine alarm. So the integration has to happen where there's commonality between, between systems. So um, that, uh, that job, for example, um, so we, we understand the, at the very basic level what that, what that part number is, what the work order is, and that's the integration point with, um, with a company like Fulcrum. And then for, for maintenance, it's really those, uh, those assets, right? Those, those machines, there needs to be a connection to the CMMS, to upkeep, to know that this asset in machine metrics is the same asset in upkeep. So there's, um, you only really need to have that, that unique identifier for that, the, the primary objects that need to communicate. So if you're, if you're in a monolithic system, you're gonna have to own it all, right? So you don't have that flexibility to go really deep into your area of expertise. You know? So we go really deep into understanding you know, data from a machine at, uh, at the, uh, the multi kilohertz level, right? We store that data, we use that for, you know, for understanding, for predicting problems. Well, that data does not have to flow to an upkeep, right? So that's, uh, that is really the, I think the, the, the difference between that decentralized system versus the monolithic system. You're not gonna go that deep, right? It's not gonna be that integrated into, the, into your, your technical domain. Maybe just to jump on that, Bill, I, I think you brought up a really good point. Um, what, I, what I hear from you is like, when you, when you use a monolithic system, you're basically resorting to the least common denominator. And that's what you standardize everything else on. It's good because now everything speaks a common language. When you pull a report, you basically, you know, again, look at a report that all speaks a common language the kind of like challenge that we all deal with with best in class vertical software is that you could have diff different systems speaking different languages or even you know in this analogy different dialects of the same language and that translation layer is super critical and so you know i, I think what we're hitting on graham is just the importance of this translation translation layer i think that's why we've kind of delved into this topic around, you know, iPaaS solutions, integrations, and the importance of that. Um, and, and there's probably, that's probably why there's so many questions centered, centered around, you know, okay, if we do go this best in class vertical system software route, then how do we integrate and how do we create a translation layer between all the different systems? I think philosophically, what we're all saying is that it's not the customer's concern. We should be figuring it out amongst ourselves and our engineers should be working together. And in the past, it's always been endemic on, on it, it was the responsibility of the customer to figure this out. And I think that's why there's a lot of questions is like, hey, we've always been the ones figuring this out, help us figure this out. I think we should, we're, we're solving it. You know, we're, we're working really hard behind the scenes to make this a great uh, experience. And I think philosophically, the difference between the monolithic and the, the, the best in, in class software is is a little bit 
more towards the customer, right? The three of us, we're all trying really hard to win the love and support of the end users. And we're gonna connect our systems in the background, but all the people that are empowered to make change on the shop floor, those are the people we're all building software for and, and getting really excited to make their lives better. I think in a monolithic system, the database is what everybody's trying to make happy, right? So I think that that change might be a very small nuanced difference, but I think it's gonna create a world of difference for the end user experience for the people that are actually doing the work. So I have a question. I have a question for you, Sunny, on, on this. And, and you know, it kind of got my brain spinning. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, who is the owner? Who should be the owner of connecting the dots and creating that translation layer? And you know, I, I think for every software vendor, for every technology vendor, the kind of like MO has been, oh, we have an open platform, we have open APIs, you know, go figure it out. I actually don't see enough vendors taking responsibility for, you know, trying to be the, the, the translation layer and really helping customers out with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree, Ryan. You know, a good example is, you know, and you're using your modern CRM software, it's a click of a button, right? To connect one system to another, right? Like where, where does this, where does this go right today when you have, you know, you know, there's obviously system integrators, right? But, you know, we're trying to make this quick. Uh, we're trying to prove value fast. Like what can, you know, what can, it, Sunny is the solution and, you know, Bill is the solution. Vendors that, you know, are just, you know, it's almost like a revolution of vendors working together, building these, you know, almost like plug and play, quick, you know, button click integrations. Like what does that look like? Well, Graham, the, the, there's actually some conversations in the chat. I'm trying to keep up. It's really difficult. Um, I think Tim <laughs> Smith is, is uh, you know, mentioning how he's seen a lot of success using these um, iPass systems, right? So, you know, Zapier, Integromat, you know, those companies are, you know, are there to connect those dots. Um, ideally, we'd all have out-of-the-box integrations, but that's not reality, right? Like it's, uh, you know, the three of us can work together and make sure that we have those integrations really nice, but there's many other vendors that, you know, we'll need to connect to. So that's not the reality. But like I said before, you do need, I, I don't, I'm not sure, Sonny, I think it, ideally we all work together, the vendors do it, but the reality is there's going to need to be, um, there's those exceptions, which right now is more the rule where you'll need to have somebody that runs these systems, these no code iPass systems that connects the dots, you know, they'll, they'll connect the events, the APIs and, and make the systems talk. I think that's right. And we're the three of us, we're all founders, right? We all like to talk about visions of the future and how things are going to work. But I think, and, and I think the reality of the future is that these systems will work and the congruency will just happen organically. But we're moving from a world where the person in charge of integration was this big systems integrator, value added reseller, to maybe somebody in, in an IT department that is on site, that's part of the company that, that's implementing the software to hopefully the next step is the end user who understands the business is the person connecting the dots. And then hopefully as much of that happens as, as automatically as possible, right? So I think the transition right now is between an expert that doesn't actually understand your business doing it to someone who understands your business that's part of your business that's able to do it to hopefully an end user at the, in, in, the, in the distant future that's able to do it out of the box as well. So I think in our own businesses, we've all seen the value of taking the responsibility of who's doing something to the person that actually knows the business. I think we're all trying to achieve that same effect too, with as many tools as possible, as many Zapiers and Integromats and whatever it may be, and as great of APIs as we have. I think the goal is to make it so that business understanding and business knowledge, that is what's driving this integration and, and, and this work, so. I'm like furiously typing answers while I, while I also tried to moderate. Uh, you know, so, you know, obviously we're also getting a lot of questions, There's clearly a lot of IT minded people here, right? Um, you know, looking for this, you know, this unified language, you know, some people are, you know, expressing, you know, OPC UA, some people are, you know, saying MT Connect is working on a solution here, right? Like it's, it's, you know, Bill, like I know, you know, for you, for example, right? You know, the whole purpose of machine metrics is trying to make it easy uh, uh, to collect, transform, and contextualize data, like you know, where, like, 
what do you see as the, you know, the solution here? If, you know, if unified data, right, uh, making data easy uh, to understand, to transform into a common model, like, you know, what's a good approach for manufacturers? And you can't, your answer can't just be, well, obviously you should use machine metrics. Like, you know, there's all sorts of other parts, components of the business, right? That require that translation. You know, what would, you know, what would your recommendation be for you know, a manufacturer that has so many different assets? Uh, well, I mean, pick the tool that that's familiar with the um, with that type of asset, right? So, if you're you know connecting you know quality inspection equipment, you know make sure that you're um, you know you know how to access that that equipment. I mean, there are standards out there, um, and I, I saw some of the you know some comments around OPC UA, right? Uh, Modbus. There's there's these open protocols that will enable you to access data from many different assets. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds, right? Sometimes you have to um, uh, you have to get a, a you know sort of software from the vendor to access the data. But um, you know that that's really step one is to is to get data from your equipment, and then you have to transform that into that um, into that data structure so you can run analytics across all of your different equipment. Um, you know that's what you know we spend a lot of time on. Um, we're not you know we're not the only ones, right? So there's you know, there's other companies that are able to. To pull data and uh, and make that accessible. Um, I guess that I'm not sure if that was your question, Graham, but um, but that really is. Um, you know, I, I think making sure that you know how to access data from your equipment is really uh, is really a step one. Excellent. Well, um, you know, I can tell based on the screen share that um, you know it looks like our time is up. We had hundreds of unanswered questions, but that's a good thing. Our objective here was to try to stoke the conversation. Uh, not necessarily push our, you know, our, our vendorship. So, you know, and you guys did a great job. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, this is meant to be the beginning of a conversation, not the end. So I urge you all to, uh, you know, connect with each of the panelists, including myself on LinkedIn, um, continue to, uh, you know, challenge preconceived notions for how things should be done. Uh, that's how true innovation is created. And uh, we look forward to a successful rest of the IIoT world uh, Digital Manufacturing Day. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Graham, Sonny, and, and Bill, and really appreciate all the attendees for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you. I love all the questions, and I, I hope that we get to answer them over time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>